friend Dr. Mandika from Sri Lanka, uh, <clears throat> a very senior vascular surgeon who is going to talk to about bypass surgery to salvage the CLI extremity, uh, the Sri Lanka experience. Thank you. Thank you, Shubhan. Uh, thank you so much for inviting us for this uh, <coughs> inaugural HIMVAS uh, meeting. Honored to be here, me and uh, Rizni from Sri Lanka. Um, I didn't uh, plan to talk about the entire vascular service uh, in Sri Lanka, but I'm lucky that I'm following the Bangladeshi uh, uh, vascular service. I think we are very similar in what we do. Um, we have a predominantly public hospital, a government hospital-led health service, which is uh, free for anybody who comes in. There is no bill. And most of the interventions happen in the government hospitals. Um, private hospitals is where people love to come and consult, but the majority cannot afford uh, to have interventions in the private sector. So, what, just like in uh, Bangladesh or most other countries, the bread and butter of the vascular surgeon in Asia is salvaging ischemic limbs and treating venous ulcers and varicose veins. And we do hardly any surgery now for veins. Most of it is laser a lot of foam sclerotherapy. Um, more foam sclerotherapy recently because of the cost issues. We also had a problem in getting dollars to import technology. So we were lucky to end up with at least foam sclerotherapy. Um, aneurysms are done open in the great majority except a very small number that Rizni does in the private sector. Sri Lanka also has a problem uh, with the health professionals. Um, the radiologists are completely in charge of the cath lab, and they do not allow surgeons in there. So whatever endovascular work that is done is done by the radiologists. They don't see patients. We need to refer them and we need to do the follow-up. They just do the intervention. So with that background, uh, I was planning to uh, take you through this, uh, what we do for limb salvage in Sri Lanka. So for those, some of the visitors from uh, outside Asia, we are a tiny, uh, tiny island of the coast of India, uh, which is about, uh, which has about 20, uh, 22 million population, uh, surrounded by the ocean. And let me just remind you that we are planning to have our um, vascular meeting in May this year, and Rizni will get in touch with all of you regarding uh, coming over. Uh, we see a lot of Indian. Uh, tourists recently coming over to enjoy the uh, ocean which surrounds us. Yeah, so there was a general feeling that peripheral vascular disease was uh, a, a, a Caucasian disease and that Asians were less affected, but, and it, that it was thromboangiitis predominantly. The scenario has changed completely and I put up some Sri Lankan data to show that we have a similar prevalence of arterial occlusive disease uh, to the United States. Critical limb threatening ischemia presents, it's a global problem. It's a life threatening issue. To survive, you might need to have the limb amputated. We see gross disease in Asia because people don't come to us when the lesion is early, and they get antibiotics for whatever lesion and repeated debridement if they go to a surgeon. 
who doesn't think of ischemia, but they treat infection by repeated debridement. Critical limb-threatening ischemia, although it's global, predominantly affects the population in the lower middle income and lower income countries, and that is predominantly South Asia. It's difficult to salvage these limbs. It's really difficult. It takes a lot. And it's harder when you're in a resource-limited setting. So challenges in the management of critical limb threatening ischemia in Sri Lanka would probably uh, mean uh, that we share a lot of these problems in this part of the world. And I wish to highlight the comorbidities, the limb lesions that we, the severity of the lesions that we deal with, the anatomy, the occlusive anatomy, and options we have for revascularization, and the outcomes we get with what we have. We see a lot of technology being uh, demonstrated at this meeting, but how much of it really can be used to treat the man on the street? Finally, our population gets what they can afford, what they can access. So what happens is what we were really interested to know in our setting. So the data comes to us from a study we, we did from 2015 for three consecutive years where we use real world consecutive patients and the data was prospective and entered into a computer and all the patients were followed up and independently verified. And we used uh, the SPSS and the life tables to assess outcomes. So we had two out of three were males, median age was 65, and we studied 367 uh, patients who fitted into the SVS uh, OPG criteria. That is, those who had a revascularization and who had suitable vein. So w you could see that 80% were diabetics. And Sri Lanka is a country with one out of four adults are struck down with diabetes. One out of three in Colombo, the capital, are diabetics, adults. And the life expectancy is 75 plus. So you see people are living longer with a lot of diabetes and they are going to present to us with all the complications of this problem. So that's the, re uh, the all island study on uh, diabetes prevalence which I just mentioned. We are equal to Tamil Nadu, Mauritius and the Pacific Islands. So diabetes, is not just cigarette smoking, it comes with a whole baggage of problems, neuropathy, nephropathy, severe ischemic heart disease, and poverty, and a threatened limb, which is easy wounding and delayed presentation. So in that background, comorbidities, what are the lesions that we deal with? And we have uh, assessed the severity according to the SVS Wi-Fi grading severity, and you could see the patients that we are meet to treat, to salvage limbs, most of them have wound two or three, which are advanced lesions. We don't have, we haven't revascularized patients entirely for ischemic rest pain. They all had necrosis of significant levels, and 45% had gangrene, R6 rather than 6. And the median toe pressure was 28 millimeters mercury. And foot infection was very common. And moderate to severe infection was seen in 72%. That is three out of every four. And if you look at clinical stage, they were all stage three or four advanced stage patients that we have to deal with, according to the Wi-Fi clinical staging system. So non-healing necrosis, despite repeated debridement by the general surgeons is what we have to salvage in the great majority of instances. It is not uncommon for a person to come with a gangrenous or an ulcerated toe, end up with graded amputations, ending up with a proximal amputation. It is what patients experience in most instances. What about the anatomy? If you look at the bypasses we did 
on these patients, you see that the great majority, 55% had a paramalleolar outflow. So they were long, predominantly tibial occlusive disease, probably due to the diabetes. So 45% were femoropopliteal bypasses, and 55%, 43.6% uh, were popliteal to paramalleolar, whereas femoro paramalleolar bypasses accounted for 11.4%, adding up to more than half going down to the ankle. What about the options that we have? We need urgent revascularization because of the sepsis and the severe necrosis. And we need maximum revascularization to salvage these feet. So do we do bypass surgery or do we do balloon angioplasty? We just have access to plain balloons, even in the private sector. Or do we amputate? We do amputate when the necrosis is already finished off the foot. Balloon angioplasty, we have very limited access to the cat lab or a C-arm and the disposables. So we have limited our we have reserved fragile patients, patients without veins, or failed bypasses. Those are the patients who generally get balloon angioplasty. And we also have only one chance for maximum revascularization of these patients. We need to choose between bypass and balloon angioplasty. They do not come back for repeated in interventions. So we adopt a vein bypass first approach and leave the limited balloon facility for those other categories. So anybody with necrosis and absent foot pulses becomes a candidate for our uh, attention. The cardiac criteria that we use for inclusion include, include acute coronaries within three months, congestive heart failure, and an eject fraction ejection fraction of less than 45%, we would uh, consider them not for surgery, but for balloon angioplasty. And suitable veins, fortunately we still have patients, a significant proportion of them have suitable veins, which are at least more than three millimeters, but we have used even 2.5 to three millimeter veins uh, for uh, bypass surgery. Our imaging technique is surgeon-led color duplex ultrasound arterial imaging. We don't rely on uh, CT angiography because of the calcification. It's really difficult to figure out which is a problem. So surgery, when it comes to bypass, is a combined spinal epidural or sometimes just a, a, just a spinal with no invasive monitoring. When is what we go for, either from the same leg or the opposite leg or the, rarely the upper limb veins. And the distal anastomosis we do, we control with rubber sloops and we avoid using any clamps on these calcified arteries and the anastomosis and that's it, patients back in the general ward. So, these are some of the 55% uh, the infra uh, uh, paramalleolar outflow tracks that I mentioned earlier. A pedal outflow. So this is what we do in the great, great majority. And wound care is also entirely our business. So patients, of course, don't care about our efforts. They are only interested in what the outcomes are. So let me present to you what we have for the 367 patients. We looked at 30 day, one year, and up to three years of overall survival, limb salvage, and amputation free survival, including healing and quality of life and ambulation. So if you compare, outcomes are meaningless unless you compare it with something. So we compared the 30 day outcomes with the International Wound Group of Diabetic Foot, international group, and we find the mortality and the major amputation rates are acceptable in our settings. Major cardiac adverse events and major adverse limb events are also under 10% and 
compatible with the international standards. We looked at the 12 month outcomes of the University of Colombo data that I just presented with that of the SVS uh, benchmarks and the National Surgical Quality Improvement Program of the uh, United States for in terms of mortality, male, maize, and amputation. Of course, the baseline characteristics of these samples are significantly different. You could see that we, our patients were younger. They were, median age was 65, whereas obviously the uh, North American population had more patients beyond the age of 80, but they were predominantly smokers, and their, their diabetes was significantly less than what we deal with in South Asia. And of course, even they were, their sample included a fair proportion of ischemic rest pain, whereas I can't find data where people present only those limbs revascularized for necrosis, because we know there's a huge difference in the outcomes if you do Rutherford uh, trees uh, and you, know, you put them into critical limb ischemia. So we don't have data which excludes ischemic rest pain. We have 100% necrosis, whereas the SVS groups have only 74% and the NSQIP has only 60% necrosis. Nevertheless, the SVS bench benchmark I have shown for males and male, overall it's 8%, and this is where we were, 8.2 for males, NSQIP was 4.2. For male, we were within the benchmark, we were actually doing better than the NSQIP. Amputations, we were just above the SVS benchmarks. For the distal bypass group, the benchmark is set at 10% for males and 9% for male. So we were within the benchmark for both, for the distal category. For amputation, it was the same. We were within the benchmark. So if you look at overall survival, limb salvage and amputation-free survival, we have 80% for both overall survival and limb salvage, 65% for amputation-free survival at one year. And this is the SVS benchmarks, 80, 84, and 71% was the amputation-free survival. Wound healing, we had 85% healed completely at one year. Those that are not healed were small areas of um, osteomyelitis. They were not affecting ambulation, and the median time to healing was three months. So the, here are some of the examples. This is what we, or the dream of the surgeon, to get a spurter when you debride the wound after a bypass. Beyond one year, we followed up all our patients for a minimum of 36 months, three years. And here you see overall survival is 65%, but according to the life table, 50% at five years. And surprisingly, that's what the whole world has finally. Half of them are dead in, after five years. And we are no different, despite all the the disadvantage we, we have, the resource limits, and the follow-up problems we have. Limb salvage, 72% at 36 months. And amputation-free survival, that means you're alive with a limb, is just under 50%. But you can see that most people who are alive have a limb. If you looked at the con confounders for amputation-free survival, it was the only confounder was significant one was being a female. Females do significantly worse than the males. Fortunately, we have less females presenting to us with critical limb-threatening limb ischemia. So what we have, diabetes, long duration, neuropathy, necrosis, limb threat severity is high, most people refuse to have a proximal amputation. They say, do whatever it takes to heal my foot. And we are very limited with uh, cath labs. Access to wound care and economics is a huge drawback. So 
un outpatient follow-up is unpredictable, lack of community wound care, all these problems, despite all these problems, I think we have achieved quite a bit. We looked at quality of life for those whose limbs were salvaged and those who had amputations and the limb salvage as expected did significantly better uh, in terms of quality of life and ambulatory status. People walk, still walk amazingly with whatever that is left for them at the end of the day. So, Mr. President, it is possible to achieve global standards in amputation-free survival. Real world, lower middle income, resource limited South Asian, public health setting. Surgeon led RDD duplex guided vein bypass surgery, first approach. In a population characterized by diabetes, necrosis, infection, severe ischemia, and late stage of disease. Despite all these, we can still achieve reasonable outcomes for our population. That's the message I want to uh, leave. Yes, we do need endovascular interventions for the population who are not fit for bypass surgery. But those who are fit for this can very well uh, have it and we can do a great service to the great majority of the population, not the selected few who can afford. Thank you.